I learned for certain that I'm at my very best when in a challenge. And the deeper the challenge, the better I am. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. Natasha Miller is the founder and CEO of Entire Productions in San Francisco. Her company has made the ink list of fastest growing companies in the U.S. several years in a row. Natasha is also a single mom, has experienced homelessness and depression, and we're going to talk about everything. Natasha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Very good to be here. So great to have you. And I think I'd like to start with the company. Tell us about your company. And then I think we work backwards. So let's talk about what you do. And let's do how about what you do as if it's 2019. And then what you do (laughs) as if it was 2020. Good idea. So um, Entire Productions is an event an entertainment production company. And our target clients, the, the ones that we mostly service are Fortune 500 companies. And because we're in San Francisco, that means Facebook and LinkedIn and Adobe and Airbnb and Salesforce, like literally all the tech companies and also pharmaceutical companies and banks. And we produce over the top, amazing, wildly creative events for their company events. So sometimes internal, sometimes client facing, sometimes product launches. And in 2018, we did 777 events. In 2019, our goal was to do less and bigger. So we did 650. And then we can move into 2020 when we had, you know, the big P, big pandemic. And you can imagine all of those companies stopped doing events and they stopped doing them as of March 16th. So your industry, because it's different from so many other industries where there was more of a slow fade to new normal, you went from having the best years you've ever had and having front row seat to wild parties and producing incredible experiences to an absolute stop with really no in-between, is that correct? Hard stop, that fade to black was immediate. So how do you deal with that? And what kind of mindset do you as the leader have (laughs) to have to just like keep it together? Well, here's what happened to me. I freaked out, I had a, a panic attack which isn't, you know, the little ones like, oh my God, what's going on? It was like the full throttle, full body panic attack. And I know what they are and I know what they feel like. So I didn't think I was dying. I didn't think I was having a heart attack, but I couldn't come out of it. And the reason I had this attack was my multi, my profitable multi-million dollar business that I had built over 20 years had gone to zero. I had a million dollar payroll and everything shut down. And so the first reaction is panic and fight or flight. So let's just be honest, it was just a really uncomfortable, and that's putting it lightly, situation. Then I had to make some hard decisions. And those decisions I made before other people in my industry came to them. And I called my fractional COO, I called my CFO, and I called my own personal wealth advisors. And I brought them together and I said, Here's a situation, and what do you think I should do? I'm thinking furloughs and layoffs. And I think they were taken aback by that because it was so early on, but I could see the writing on the wall, and I didn't want to put myself in a position of doing the impossible and, and, and also going into debt. At that moment, we didn't have a PPP. We didn't have a government bailout. So I did a a wave of layoffs and a little bit of furlough. 
I did another way of layoffs and it was horrific. It felt horrible. I was scared. I was embarrassed. I felt humiliated, especially because no one around me was doing it yet. But really, it was the best business decision that I could have made. And I'm very proud that I did it. Um, I'm not proud. I'm, I'm sorry for the people that I had to let go, but they're, they've landed on their feet. They're going to be okay. After that was done, I had an aha moment. And that's where I came up with a solution for virtual events that put us on the map. We were first to market with it. I knew that it would be the answer to our situation, but I also knew it would be the answer to our client situation, but it took them a while to get on board. That situation and that solve was doing faster, short paced, segmented variety shows. So if you had a message that you wanted to deliver, you had a keynote speech, you had a town hall meeting, you had whatever it is that you wanted to deliver, Nobody wants to sit and watch someone deliver something for a straight hour unless they're entertained, unless their brain waves get to shift from, oh, that was cool. Okay, here we are serious. Oh, wow, what's next? Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. So I presented this to my team. I think they thought I was a little bit off my rocker. I had a whole deck that I created and I actually called the head of Mansueto Vent Ventures, which owns Inc. Magazine and Fast Company, Eric. And he's now become a friend since, you know, being on the list and speaking for their conferences and such. And I presented it to him. So nowhere in this did I hesitate and go, oh, I don't know if it's ready for the CEO of two major business magazines. I just went for it. And the outcome of that was we were first to market with this solution, but we also ended the year last year with doing over 200 virtual events, which I would say is a total win. We also ended the year, mind you, I cut my expenses greatly with a slight amount of profit. Congratulations, because in your industry, a slight amount of profit it feels like the profit probably from 2019, not your bank account, but just the success and the feeling of, hey, we did it. We, we got through that. So I want to go back to how quickly was panic attack? And thank you for honestly and vulnerably sharing that. How quickly was panic attack to pivot? How long did it take your brain to sort of grieve and deal and then to get creative and say, all right, I got nothing to lose. Let's go. Yep. Timeline is panic attack a few days after uh, everything shut down, realizing I had to lay off. So that was about a week. I did it quickly. And then after that subsided, that gave my mind the room to start becoming creative. And the ideation started really flowing. And I woke up one day, I had this idea, I knew it was going to work. I presented it to my team. And two weeks later, we had our first entire variety show, which was three segments. One was an interview with an entrepreneur, one was a performance, and I'd have to look back and see what the third one was. And in between woven some interactive activities. And we presented, I think we had 80 of our clients on this show. And we were saying, okay, here's the show that we created. You are, you are consuming it just like your people will consume your own events. We weren't really hard selling. We weren't doing any of that, but we were like, this is what you can do. And it did take a little bit of time, but people now call us all the time and we're doing variety shows for all of our clients. Will you ever go back to just doing regular in-person events when the world allows it? We will do in-person events, of course. And I think my business is poised to grow by two or three times when everyone starts getting into uh, person. I do believe that virtual is here to stay in a hybrid way. Not everyone is going to want to do it. Not everyone's going to be able to afford it or they won't carve that out of their budget. But I do think that it's, it ex it's expanded people's businesses and expanded people's audience why wouldn't they continue to do that? It also makes it very easy for people that have a barrier to entry, flight, timing, 
uh, to attend and to potentially pay to attend events. There's That's another revenue stream. We just, as you've heard in the news 5 million times, we have advanced by five, 10 years in this last year on how we think, what we do, the technology and the access to technology. My whole team, there was no one on the team that was like super techie. I am, but these people rose to the occasion and now they can have a conversation with an AV team or a broadcast media team that would turn your heads. You'd be surprised that a, an event planner knows the language now of broadcast media. You really don't know what people are made of until they've had to go through some stuff and make a decision. All right, how will I come out of this? And the last, you know, 2020 essentially forced every single person, whether personal life or professional life, to have to do that. And you were in an industry that really, really was decimated. And I love hearing about the pivot because so many people who weren't decimated also had to pivot. And any aspiring entrepreneur listening to this, understand and learn how to pivot because you might not have to go through a pandemic with your business, but you will have to pivot. So having the pivot mindset is so critical. And those who pivot well, win. Yes. And I think people need to understand that really everyone's pivoting and making decisions and changes happening all the time, even pre-pandemic. It was a little easier to bite off. And sometimes you could choose, do you want to go down that path or not? With the pandemic, there was no choice. It was pivot or shut down for a year or however more. But I would say also this. So I had to save my company. I had to reinvent our offerings. We also added a division, which is why we could triple. So doubling would make sense, right? With in-person and virtual. But we added a premium gifted a premium gifting promo item division. All of our clients need to buy stuff, gifts for their speakers, gifts for their you know C-suite, uh, branded items to deliver for people that are watching virtual things. So that's one thing. But then on the flip side, Christy, I had the advantage of just being supercharged with my creativity, my ideation. And so this year, three things are going to happen. And I don't think they would have happened in this small amount of time had we not had the situation we had last year. I started a podcast, Fascinating Entrepreneurs. I'm releasing a memoir, which tentatively is called Relentless Tenacity, My Journey from a Homeless Shelter to the Inc. 5000. And I'm also creating an entrepreneurial master's course that dives a little bit deeper than a lot of the ones that are available right now into reading financial statements, how to hire and fire and create culture and just, just a little bit more deeper dive. Some, everything I wish that I would have known 10 years ago. Congratulations. It's really fun to hear the energy and the passion you have now, which I suspect if we turn back the clock a year ago, we were right either in the thick of the, the hardest days uh, that you had or they were just about to come. So for people in the professional space, people who are either entrepreneurs or in leadership, what's the one thing that you think they need to know or should learn from what we all went through in the last year? Well, I think for me, thinking about what happened to me and applying it to the other people is that I immediately thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose everything. Not remembering what I have between, you know, these two ears. And I have the ability to do so many things other than what I do for entire productions. And it took me a few weeks to have that reminder. So you have within you so many other things, whatever you're doing at your core that you can lean on. Now, if you're 13, right, you're still developing and such, but still, even then, you know, whatever you're really good at, you have this array of things that you can also lean on. So that's number one. And number two is there's such a wealth of information and access to learning that is such an incredible thing. Mentors, advisors, classes, courses, podcasts, blogs. It's all out there for you. 
So if you want to learn something and you want to be able to pivot, uh, or you want to take this opportunity to pivot, you can go for it. So it's mindset and education. And I suspect that some of the tenacity, some of the grit, some of the push that you had during the last year, you gained from the struggles that you had in your personal life prior to that. Because based on my experience and the people I've talked with on this podcast, people that can pivot and can push through things in their professional life or their personal life learned it Mm -hmm. before that in another kind of struggle. And the type of struggle is irrelevant because what you learn from it applies in other aspects of your life. So let's talk about some of the things that you had to overcome in your personal life that made you by nature an overcomer and a doer and a pusher in your professional Mm -hmm. life when it came to a hard stop. So the name of your book is, or the working title of the memoir, includes homeless shelter. So Mm -hmm. tell me about that. Yes. So you're correct on all the pivots and all the challenges that I had before really did lead to my being able to turn this around so quickly. I learned for certain that I'm at my very best when in a challenge. And the deeper the challenge, the better I am. So that's interesting. But to flash forward or backward to Christmas Day when I was 16, and there was a certain experience that was going on in my home that led it to be not safe for me to be there. So I was taken to a youth emergency shelter and dumped, basically. That's one major thing that is really hard to get over emotionally, but the fuel of my wanting to to put on the map, I am worthy. I want you to see me. I am someone that doesn't deserve to be, you know, dropped off at this place and kind of let go of is definitely the fuel of the fire that has led me to do all the things that I've been accomplishing in my life. Uh, that wasn't the first, but that was definitely a major uh, moment. And I did eventually get out of that situation and it was suggested that I go to foster care and I was like, no way, I'm not going to foster care. I am the, I'm a violinist. I'm a classically trained violinist and I'm studying with a college professor at Drake. Meanwhile, I'm a high school student so that, you know, I have some big aspiration that I can't move 200 miles away from potentially. And so I saw a book in the office that basically spoke about juvenile law. And I, I found out, so I did the research, I, I educated myself that I was actually an abandoned youth and not a runaway. And that's a very big difference in the court system. So I was able to leave that homeless shelter as an emancipated minor. And so I've been on my own since I was 16, Christmas Day. My goodness. So I didn't know there was a legal distinction there. So that's fascinating. And the point there about, you know, do the work, do the research, and you're on your own. As 16 year old, that's a difficult thing. That's a child. But in life, you had that in your brain that I got to do this on my own. There's nobody coming around on a white horse, a la Disney princess, who's going to pick me off my feet, and we're going to go into a fairy tale land. If I want to change my life, it's on me. So what are we going to do, Natasha? Let's go. And you knew that your whole life. Mm -hmm. No one, I mean, I did up until 16. And and quite honestly, after that, I was waiting around for someone to save me. Not even waiting, asking for help for someone to save me. And I never got it. And then, you know, that did kind of parlay, unfortunately, into relationships, you know, after it, it just, until you figure out what's going on, it doesn't end. And so I no longer, obviously, at this point in my life, need anyone to save me. I got that covered. But I also, I've had people come into my life that have given me opportunities, but you really have to be open to them and you have to be giving out as much as you need to be taken in for, I think, for that to be attracted. 
And you're a professional flip your scriptist, which I've never said before on the podcast, but you could like, you've done it a bunch of times. You did it, you know, homeless shelter as a teenager, and then you fought for yourself. So how do you get from classically trained violinist to production company? Because that's a whole nother flip <laughs> that has to happen. It's vaguely related. So um, classical violinist, jazz vocalist, so I have seven CDs that I that. I produced and I toured and have performed at performing arts halls. But if you think about where I came from and what I had to do for myself, when I became a professional musician, let's say this, let's say you're getting married and I'm performing for your wedding on Friday the 12th and two or three more people call me to say, Hey, Natasha, can your string quartet or can you perform with your jazz ensemble at my event on the 12th? Now, what is a normal, regular person going to say? They're going to say, you know what? I'm booked. Thank you for the offer, but I can't. What did I say? I said, I'm booked, but I can bring in another group that is as good as I am, probably better, and I'll manage them. And so that's how Entire Productions was informally born. I didn't have a business license. This wasn't a formal business entity. But in 2000, 2001, I think that's when I got my first business license and my first major client. And now I'm all of a sudden programming uh, musical acts to perform weekly at this real estate development uh, on their outdoor pavilion so that when all 10,000 people came out of the five buildings that they own, they would stay in that, that zone and eat at the restaurants circling it. So I'm now programming other bands of various genres, not jazz necessarily, not definitely not classical. And so that's just when things started to snowball. And they snowballed slowly because it still was a solopreneur company at that time. It was more of a lifestyle company. I was trying to be a, a solo recording artist and performance artist. But in 2009, I took an entrepreneurship course at Berkeley School of Music. It was online, strangely. That's pretty early for an online course. And I really focused and I, I rebranded and relaunched entire productions. And that was the kickoff start to it being coming up a more business-like entity. My daughter was in high school. Eventually, she didn't really need me around as much. I moved it to San Francisco from this little place called Alameda. And um, as soon as I, every time I learned something new, my business grew. So I ended up doing the Goldman Sachs 10 KSB program in 2015. That following year, I applied everything I learned to my business and we grew 65%. Then we grew another 65%. Then through entrepreneurs organization that I'm in, I'm taking entrepreneurial master's courses through MIT and Harvard. And every time I do something like that, what happens? There's a growth spurt. It's all about developing yourself and preparing yourself for the next challenge, which really is the theme of your life. Do the work prepare, you're ready for the next thing. And one of the things that you talk about that other people have talked about on this podcast, and I, I so appreciate is you're very honest with the things in your life and your past that you easily could never talk about again. You could completely never talk about homeless shelter. You could never talk about struggles with relationship. You never have to tell anyone about the panic attack. And yet you choose to share. Why is it important to you to not just focus on all of the wins? Why also mm -hmm. focus or at least talk about the struggle? Well, I tell you what, I didn't tell anyone any of that up until very recently. So most of the people in my life that don't know me well in business or as a performer would be shocked to hear a lot of this. And I remember being at the Inc. 5000 conference a year and a half or two years ago, I, for the first time, said out loud, and I, I had to preface it with, I'm writing a memoir, this is going to come out. I have to practice saying this out loud. And it was so awkward. And, but I knew for sure that it was actually a strength 
versus a weakness, especially since I had overcome some things, right? I haven't overcome everything, by the way. My life is really good, but there's definitely room for improvement. And I think saying it out loud is just such a help to other people because everyone keeps that kind of thing stuffed and, and, and tucked away nicely. And if you feel like talking about it, I think you should be able to talk about it. And if you don't feel like talking about it, that's fine too. But if you look at my social media and you look at you know the articles written about me and you look at my website, all it looks like is, oh my God, she and entire productions is amazing. It's impossible. No, it's not. It's not. And in fact, I think, you know, I gave a talk recently to a corporation. It was very unscripted. It was very off the cuff. And the responses I got, and I talked about mental health. I've talked about panic attacks. I talked about depression. The responses I got, I was so surprised at. Why I should have been surprised, I'll have to figure out. But they were from men. The comments in the chat were from men. The verbal questions and comments were from men. And they said, thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for humanizing mental illness and mental health. And that's when I absolutely knew that it was important for me to just say this stuff out loud. And has it changed your perspective of what you went through because other people are saying, been there or thank you. Does that give you more confidence? It doesn't change my perspective on the past. I knew already that a lot of that fuel that I was pushing against some of the negativity that was propelling me into the future. And honestly, I would have rather just have had a really nice, loving, easier life. But I am thankful that I'm, you know, where I'm at now because of it. I'm getting more confidence in talking about it out loud. That's, I think, the most pointed part is the confidence. And I don't feel as apologetic. And you could probably see that right now, right? It's, it's no longer, I'm no longer practicing. There's a big difference between saying this happened to me and saying this is me. Mm. Because there's a separation of this is part of my story. It does not define me. I'm going to work and learn and improve my entire life because I believe that that's important. But this stuff that happened, I learned from it. It's helping me, but it does not own me. And it very much feels like that's what your this journey has been for you, is that you've made that separation between things that happened, how it impacted you, and how you can use it for the future. Yes, and I would just like to say for anyone listening that that didn't happen early, quickly, or easily. It's definitely been a journey. And, you know, I turned 50 in February. And I do think that living through life and, and seeing, seeing what can happen to a person, what they can do, gives you the motivation to keep going. So I, I experienced some wins and that just informed me, oh, there's more wins to experience, go for it. I'm willing to take some chances, but I am not defined by my past now. And I'm recently not defined by one sort of strain. I had to really work on getting over this one mental spiral that I kept doing. And I would say it's been a year and a half since I was able to overcome that. So it's not gonna happen all at once, or maybe it can. Maybe it can happen all at once for somebody else. It just didn't happen that way for me. And that getting to that point, did you work through that alone? Did you work through that with a professional? Did you work through that by talking to other people? Did you journal? People go through the processing mm -hmm. so many different ways. What worked for you? So I have kept a journal since I was 10 years old. And in writing the book, I went back to those journals because I was wondering if I over-exaggerated or drama made my story more dramatic than it was. And the beauty of having journals is you can figure out what you're embellishing on and what you're not. And I was surprised to see that the situation was actually at times worse than I was recalling. And I thought, wow, 
my brain did that to temper it and to survive. That was an interesting reflection. Now, had I looked back at those journals 10 years ago, I may not have had that reaction. So writing a journal is definitely helpful. Talking with friends, but I, I haven't been, I didn't have a lot of people that I confided in in these things. Um, definitely going to a therapist has been incredibly beneficial and, you know, Sometimes it's one person for a few years. Sometimes it's one, a different person for 17 sessions. These are real life experiences here. And then recently for me, it's been another person for the last two years. And as you change and you grow, you may change and grow out of who you're, you know, getting professional help from. You may also be able to stay with the same one for 10 years. But I do think it's important to talk to somebody that's objective and skilled and trained. So here we are, your business has pivoted, you are looking to the future with many exciting opportunities and expectations. You're writing a book, you have a podcast, you are talking about some of the things that you hadn't talked about in the past that will help other people. What else is on the horizon for you, Natasha, that you're excited about or that you think will happen? I'm excited that every time I have an opportunity to learn that it kind of catapults me into another direction that I'm not aware maybe existed or existed for me. And the more I learn, this is so trite, the more I learn, I realize the more I don't know. And so at this age, to think that I can live the rest of my life by being pretty astounded and awed by new things, new ideas, new information is exciting. It's never ending if you keep looking for it. It's great. And it's a perfect way to get to the last question of the podcast, which is, is there a a book or a quote or a lyric, and since you're a musician, perhaps it's going to be a lyric, I'm really interested to hear what you pick, <laughs> that has helped you and motivated you as you flipped your script. Yes, and I thought hard about this because as a musician, you know, I love so many different kinds of music and I, and I actually love to read a lot of fiction actually, but the song that I wanted to refer to is actually from my first record called Her Life, and it's the title track, called her life and if you listen to it you can hear it's sort of the siren song of this girl who has been very let down by her the, the people the family that those are the people that are supposed to protect you and then furthermore you know this the circumstances that arose out of being brought up that way and you hear sort of this cry for help in the song and in the song, though, there are lyrics that suggest the potential of, for opportunity. It's just a hint of there's got to be something better for me. And I just think that's the one that I should talk about because it really is sort of, it's the glimpse of the turning point for me. And how many years ago did you come up with the lyrics? Probably 20, let me see, I recorded in 20. 2001. I probably wrote it the year before that or the, or two years before that. So I would and have, yeah. Do you still refer to it or, or think about specific lyrics or is it the general theme of the song that really helps you when you're having a tough day? Yeah. I mean, I think, gosh, now I really should have prepared this. So I knew a girl, it might even be me making my way to my destiny along the road her mom got in the way really from the start some might say and you know as as the song progresses it kind of walks you through things that had happened to me but the things that i was i'm looking forward to and a lot of that record her life is about things that i wanted to happen or dreaming about that's one of the pivots of one of the first pivots in my life and as you said earlier, it's about doing the work and it doesn't happen overnight. And for you, it started, you know, with some of those lyrics, but it continued and it continued and it evolves. And as you learn more, you do new things, you achieve some of those aspirations and those dreams that you talked about 
20 some years ago. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It was a delight. I really appreciate it. So many things we can learn from Natasha's story about changing. It's so important to be open to what could happen next, to look to the past for what it was, and to move forward through the present into the future, knowing that change will happen. Be open to learning. So many things we can learn as long as you're willing to do the work and to consider the next move that your life is going to make. Focus on what you can do and not what you don't have or can't do or shouldn't do or can't be. Focus on what you have always. My hope is Natasha's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.